Open with me in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 5. We've been in Romans chapter 4 and in Romans chapter 5 the past couple of weeks. We have seen this verse, but I want you to approach it today with a fresh set of eyes. Be open to the spirit of wisdom and revelation to flow. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it says, For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. We know that the two individuals in this scripture, one of them is Adam, the other one is Jesus. Several weeks ago, we looked at verse 12. We're not going to look at it now. But we know that because of one man's offense, sin entered into the world and death through sin. And for that, sin passed upon all men. For that, all have sinned. And that one man was Adam. He really opened up the door to sin and death. And unrighteousness is an automatic consequence of sin. You can't sin and feel good about it. I mean, you can sin and feel good about it for a moment. But after a while, could be instantly, could be overnight, could be sometime later, uh, a sense of guilt and shame, especially if the presence of God were to show up. You, I mean, you would think about what you did, what you said, and you would just feel unworthy in the presence of God. But with this verse in verse 17, sin now in verse 17 is behind us. He says, for if by one man's offense death reign. We, 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 we talk about you reign. Beautiful songs today. Because of Adam's mess, mistake, death reigned on the planet. Death reigned through the one. He said, for if by one man's offense, death reign, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. We've been talking about righteousness. Those that receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, they will reign in life through Jesus Christ. Let me read this out to amplify it because it, it really magnifies it. The uh, reason why I'm taking my time is because this is the scripture God really wants you to have a revelation of today. For if because of one man's trespass, lapse, offense, death reigned through that one, much more, surely, surely, will those who receive God's overflowing grace and unmerited favor and the free gift of righteousness, putting them in right standing with, with himself, reign as kings in, the, in life through Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I think we missed a part of that. The title for today is Reigning in Righteousness. This is in our, our fourth week. The first thing we learned is that right, well, what righteousness is. The ability to stand in the presence of God as if sin has never before existed. Then we learned that you need boldness. God had boldness. The end game of Satan, the reason why he tempts you to sin is not for sin's sake. He wants you to feel unrighteousness because then he can pick your pocket, right? So you need boldness. So you, you got to learn how to deal with unrighteousness in your life. Then we learn on last week the how. How am I going to be able to stand in the presence of God as if sin is never before? We're righteous by faith, right? So we do it by faith, not by feeling. It's by faith. Now, all of these are available free of charge. You can go back. But today, we're directed by the Lord to talk about reigning. Now that we know how, we want to talk about reigning in righteousness. God intends for you and I to live victoriously in this life. But if we don't learn how to deal with unrighteousness in our lives, it will prevent us from reigning unrighteousness is sin consciousness. Um, 
unrighteousness is sin consciousness. Let me give you the example the Holy Spirit gave me this week that, like I said, this was just amazing. In John chapter 9, you remember there was a man that was born blind. In John chapter 9 and verse 1 through 3, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Man was born blind. Came out the womb blind. You imagine the impact on the parents. Oh, man. But he's a grown man. So somehow, you know, they, they've adjusted and learned how to function and love and live. But as Jesus was passing by, he saw a man who was blind but from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, uh, Rabbi, past, <laughs> who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? Is that a good question? You see somebody, you know, maybe in a wheelchair, dealing with some physical handicap, some disability. Maybe, maybe you have a friend or a loved one, and they're dealing with a real challenge. Maybe something went real bad in a relationship. Maybe car accident, some tragedy. Does the thought ever cross the mind? Why did they... Why are they going through that? Why was this child born like that? Why did... But beyond the why, there's a specific thought. Their question was specifically, who sinned? Talk about a sin consciousness. They didn't just think, why was he born that way? Would have been a good question. But they asked, who sinned? Oh, y'all going to help me today. <laughs> who sinned that this man was born? This man, who sinned? Was it him that sinned that he was born blind? Uh, or was it his parents that sinned that he was born? You know, they say there's never, there's never really a dumb question. This is actually a dumb question. How can the guy sin and he ain't even born yet to be born blind? Some of y'all ain't get that. Just think about it long enough. It'll come to you. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed. And, of course, Jesus went on and healed the man. Beautiful story. We'll read it in our chapter this week. But this is so real. This reflects the natural human mindset of most human beings. You remember when Job went through all of what he went through? Maybe you have felt like, I'm just like old Job. You know, went through a real bad season. And, I mean, was doing good and lost everything. Relationship wasn't right. His children, all of his children had died. And he was sick. But he was a servant of God. He was a church-going man. But when his three, y'all remember Job, his three friends showed up and all they wanted to know, what did you do to cause all of this to happen to you? You done sin, so let's find it out so you can deal with it. Come on, somebody. It's the natural human mind, and I'm going to deal with this today. Because, again, this reflects a mindset that could be present in all of us. And it's generally because we know that the wages of sin is death. Took Job about three chapters to get in real bad shape, and then about two chapters to get out of it. Out of 42 chapters, 36 of them are about them trying to figure out what sin did you commit? You done messed with somebody's wife. Come on, you, you done did something wrong to cause these bad things. Nobody can live for God and experience bad. That, I mean, that, they were saying that. Nobody, nobody who's doing right by God is going to experience the kind of things you're experiencing. You read Job. It's interesting. And it'll make you be like, yeah, why are you dealing with this? What did he do? He was like, I haven't done nothing wrong. Go with me to the book of Romans chapter 6. Generally speaking, it's because the wages of sin is death. 
uh, I think it was almost a couple years ago, a guy that's a, a barber was, uh, man, he was going to work and he totaled his truck and it was paid for. And, you know, of course he missed the appointment, you know, uh, because, you know, I said, like, oh man, you know, I'm sad to hear that. But you know what the first thing I thought? I thought he must not be paying his tithes. He, he must not be. Oh, y'all, come on, somebody. You know, good guy, love the Lord, saved, love his wife, got a beautiful family. How did he, how come he wreck his truck? You know, thought crossed my mind. I don't know about you. Have you ever had something happen, you know, flat tire? You know, you know, we leave church, you come out from the church, have a flat tire. You're thinking, man, I'm living right, I'm doing good, why? And then you reflect, yeah, I did cut so-and-so out the other day. <laughs> Listen carefully. In Romans chapter 6, verse 20, it says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have in the things of which you are now ashamed for the end of those things for the end of those things is death but now having been set free from sin having become slaves of God you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin death but the gift of God eternal life in the in Christ Jesus our Lord say it out loud the wages of sin is death. This is why the concept in the human mind is that when we see bad things happen, we believe bad things happen to bad people or bad things happen to good people who have done bad things because good things, bad things don't happen to good people. But that's not the case. Bad things happen because there's the devil. And people that aren't dealing with the devil on his level. Now, the wages of sin is death. That is a true statement. Sin opens the door to death. And don't, don't process death like Adam's wife did in the garden. When she saw that it was good for food, that I'm not going to eat this and then fall over dead, she partook of it. And guess what? She did not physically in that moment fall over dead. They went on to live. They lived for hundreds of years. I don't know how long after they sinned that they continued to live, but they lived to be about a thousand years old. There are ramifications of death. There's things about death we don't see but can manifest. Poverty is a manifestation of death. Sickness is a manifestation or ramification of death. Lack. All of that. So now notice, the wages of sin is death. Not you falling over dead, but something in these other manifestations or ramifications show up as a result of you going left when you should have went right. Of you saying something you shouldn't have said or doing something you shouldn't have done. There's a paycheck. Somebody say a paycheck. See, some of us right now, and I say this by the Holy Spirit, are dealing with real serious stuff in our lives and in our bodies, in our relationships, that the thought in our mind is because of the sins of our past that we're dealing with this physical thing today. That is a sin consciousness. That is unrighteousness. Pastor, I haven't lived right. I haven't done right. I wasn't right by people. There were things that I did when I was a child. That th th There are things that I did that I am absolutely ashamed of. If that's you, you won't reign as a king in this life. You'll wonder, like they, his own disciples wonder, who sinned? Maybe I'm not excelling. Maybe I'm not married. Maybe I'm not as financially, you know, provided for because of the sins of my past. Who sinned that this guy is dealing with what they're dealing with? Maybe my children are dealing with what they're dealing with because of what I did. And if that's your thought, you won't reign in righteousness. 
Psalm 103. Watch this combination. Psalm 103 stands at three or one through three says this. A Psalm of David. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities and who heals all your diseases? This, this man was born with a disease that prevented him from seeing. Isn't it interesting that both the forgiveness of sins and the healing of sickness is in the same verse? Could it be that because one opens the door to the other, God wants you to know assuredly that he's dealt with both? I know that'll take a minute to process. Why put it in the same verse? Why put in the one verse that not only does he forgive your sins, he also heals you of all your diseases? Could it be that God wants you to know assuredly that he's dealt with both? Because when we deal with sickness, the thought is who sinned? I don't know if you got that. Stay connected. When we deal with sickness, whether we see it in someone else or, they, or, or we're dealing it within ourselves, there's going to be a natural human mindset is that I am dealing with this because of what I did or because of what someone else did. And God wants you to know I've dealt with both. You don't have to deal with what you're dealing with. This sickness is not about who sinned but that the glory of God can be manifest and revealed. And he wants to deal with it right then on the spot. Hallelujah. Think about this. And I, don't, I won't take the time because I really got something good to teach. And this is just the introduction. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, and you can go throughout scripture and find combination of sin being dealt with and sickness being dealt with. Sin opening the door to sickness, but God has dealt with them both. Think about one of our most profound healing scriptures in 1 Peter 2, 24. Who's his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Well, maybe they put the period in the wrong place because this part of the verse is talking about sin and being free from sin. And that part of the verse is talking about a whole nother subject. No, he wants you to assuredly in the context of one to know that not only did he deal with your sin on the cross, he also dealt with your sickness in the same. So you don't have to wonder, am I dealing with or is my child dealing with what they're dealing with because of some sin? No, he dealt with both and you don't have to live with either. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number two. I'm really wound up. I'm trying to calm down and wind up at the same time. We'll get there. Hebrews 10 and two. For then would they have not ceased to be offspring? Because the worshipers, once purged, should have had no more conscious of sin. This consciousness of sin is what we're dealing with in this series. And in talking about reigning as a king in this life, you can't reign as a king in this life with a consciousness of sin. Once the sacrifice has been made, there should be no more consciousness of sin. There sh I'll say it again. There should be no more once the sacrifice has been made. And if you don't know, Jesus is your sin sacrifice. That sacrifice has already been made. Then there should be no more consciousness of sin. That's why if we sin, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us. He gets rid of that unrighteousness. But he can't leave you there. So now go back to Romans as we talk about reigning in righteousness. There should be no more. Con you shouldn't see someone with a disability and think, who sinned? No, go over there and lay hands on them. <laughs> Come on, believe, speak something. Amen. Believe that the power of God and the miracle will be revealed. It's not about their sin. Amplified, he says, for if because one man's trespass lapsed, death reigned. Emphasis on death reigning like a king. 
King Death reigned over the world. Do you think that King Death still reigns? Interesting thought. You would look in the natural and think that he does. Through the one, much more surely, those who have received the free gift of righteousness. Somebody say free gift. Righteousness is not something that you earn. The ability to stand in the presence of God is a gift. That's a privilege. That's an honor. It's not that you have never sinned. It's as if you have never sinned. But those that receive the gift, say, say it out loud, I receive the gift. Those that receive the gift more surely will reign as kings. Do you have that part? The free gift of, yeah, righteousness. Put them in the right stand. Most surely they will reign as kings. Now, if that isn't branded on your heart, I need it to be. The Holy Ghost needs you to see this. Because you're supposed not to go through life as a pauper, as a beggar, not having enough. There ought to be something that urges on the inside of you when you see a Bentley. Oh, let's see, I done lost it. <laughs> there ought to be something. When you see on YouTube, they got mansions and, oh, this is a $20 million house. There ought to be something that urges like, oh, I would love. See, when he said, I go to prepare a place, he didn't say I'm going to prepare some apartment complexes for my people. <laughs> I would get some bungalow. That's somebody when I'm a great by and by to get a bungalow in heaven. No, he said, I'm going to put in my house. There are many mansions. A mansion by definition has eight bedrooms in it. Wow, Pastor, I don't need a big house. Yes, you do. Actually, you do. But when you folks come, you know, you're not everybody all sitting up under here. You're trying to get somebody to sleep on the couch in the living room. There ought to be, he is God of heaven. And by right, you are his son and daughter. There ought to be that something that, I mean, rich clothes feel really good. Expensive shoes actually make your feet feel good. They could be like really, really high heels, but if they are real, you know, they cost a little bit of money, they feel great. Come on, somebody. If you've ever experienced nice things in life, there ought to be something on the inside of you to say, that says it shouldn't be the ungodly of this world that live well. Nice cars are actually really nice. Oh, I, don't, I don't need all of that, Pastor. And God's not really into all of that extravagance. He paves the streets with gold. There ought to be something that is on the inside of us that says, I should be in something like that. Not the drug dealer. Not the person that's robbing and pillaging. And No, not the ungodly, not the unrighteous, not the vulgar. No, it will be those that live for God. It should be a godly example that we see set before us. God wants us and has made it available to us to reign as kings in life. Reign as kings in life through one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Kings reign by decree. We don't have a king in the United States. We have president. So we really don't understand what it's like to live in a kingdom with a king. So I need you to embrace how you're supposed to live through the concept of scripture and how God sees a king. What makes a king a king and what, how a king reigns is they reign by decree. When they say something, it's going to happen. For example, in Esther chapter 1, verse number 19, if it pleases the king, let a royal decree grow out from him and let it be recorded in the laws of the Persians and the Medes so that it will not be altered, and that, but that vastly shall come no more before King Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. I want you to simply see that kings rule by decree. They came to the king saying, establish a decree and, and, and let it be. And this is, a, this is a royal decree that cannot be altered. 
That means when a king says something, it shouldn't be altered. Matter of fact, let's just say it right. When a king makes a decree, it cannot be altered. Mm. You all remember the story of Daniel, Daniel in the lion's den. Maybe the kids are learning stuff like that, right? They should write this Bible, you know, for the kids. Class. I remember Daniel in the lion's den from when I went to kids' church. We know the story. There was a group of people that didn't like Daniel. God was promoting Daniel. Daniel was president. He was over to all the areas and they wanted to find fault with him. So they said, well, man, what, it's got to be with his faith and his religion. So let's get the king to make a decree that if anybody prays, come on, somebody, that he'll get into trouble. Sure enough, in Daniel chapter 6 and verse 11 through 15, these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king. Somebody say the king. They went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a written decree that every man who petitions any God or man within 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into a den of lions? The king answered and said, this thing is true according to the law of Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is one of the captains of Judah from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you have signed makes his petition. He makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard those words, was greatly displeased, displeased within himself and set on his heart to deliver him, Daniel. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and they said, listen to this. Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no decree or statute which the king establishes may be changed. What am I taking time for today? I need to introduce to you the way a king reigns. A king rules by decree. And when they say something, they shouldn't take it back. When they say something, it should be established. When they say something, it should not be altered. God intends and expects for you to reign as a king in this life, not broke in this life. Not busted in this life, not disgusted in this life, not sick and, and, and in bad relationships. He expects you to reign as a king. And how do kings reign? They reign by decree. In Revelation chapter 19, we know that God is king of kings and Lord of lords. Is that right? Have you ever wondered who is he the kings of? Is God the king of kings, meaning the king of Scotland, the king of Wales? There's not really a king of England. There might be in the future, of course. There's a queen of England. It's a monarch. And an African king in one of the countries, Saudi Arabia, or the king of the Arab Emirates. Is that, are they the, the kings that God is king of? According to Revelation 19 and 16, y'all still here? Are we learning how to reign as kings today? Listen to this. He has on his robe. This is in the end of Revelation. There's only 22 chapters of the book of Revelation. This is seeing Jesus. And he said he has on a robe and on his thigh, there's a name that's written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Come on, that's, that, 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 that's got to be... Some nice clothes right there. You know, we, we've got T-shirts and come on, somebody. We got different Jesus strong, right? Worship. Well, he's got, he's got some garment of something. And on his thigh, it, it, it's a king of kings. I want to talk to you about king of kings for a moment. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 4 through 7, this is John seen into the future. This is him talking to Jesus. Jesus talking to John. John is writing to the church. We are the body of Christ. He says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. He says, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So it's not just from me I'm writing to you, but it's from all of these. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over 
the kings of the earth. To him who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he has made us kings and priests to his God, our Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds. Every eye shall see him. Even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, let the church say amen. amen. Ooh, I'm about to run around up in this church today. Spirit of God said to me, Spirit of God said to me that he has made us kings. And, and again, this is why you should always read your chapter. Because the word of God gets deposited in you and it can come back up. I hadn't even had prepared to talk about the fact that he has made us kings. I was just going to say king of kings, but there's an actual scripture who tells you who are the kings that he is king of. It's not just about the king of Scotland and the king of Wales and the king of Saudi Arabia. He tells us that we have been made king and he is soon to come. Soon and very soon we will see the king. Come on, somebody. Soon and very soon we shall see the king. He is coming, and they're going to see him coming in the clouds. But understand very clearly, he is the ruler over the kings of the earth. He has made us kings. Look at chapter 5. In, in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 9 and 10. Ooh, glory. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and every tongue of the people and every nation. And you made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Woo! What am I submitting to you today? You're supposed to reign as a king. And you have, whether you realize it or not, by revelation of the Lord, the scripture says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He is the king of kings, but very clearly in Revelation 1, he has made you to be a king. Out of his own blood, unto our God, you are made right now. You're not going to be crowned in the great by and by. You, as Romans 5, 17 says, if you have received the free gift of righteousness, then right now you're supposed to be reigning and and ruling and having authority and having dominion on this earth as a king. That's why when you call your bank accounts blessed, baby, they are supposed to be blessed. When you say the blessing, they are supposed to increase. They are supposed to be enlarged because that's how a king rules. What they say comes to pass. All right, sit down, sit down. I always want to say that. Glory to God. Y'all sit down for me. I'm not done yet. Somebody say, preach, Pastor. Now, with that in mind, look at Job chapter 22. See, you got to have a better attitude about life. Some of us just want to get our needs met. And he wants to do exceeding abundantly above beyond what you could ask or even imagine in Job 22 I need you to let this be branded 22 and 28 God says you shall decree, you shall also decree a thing and it shall be established in the King James he said you shall decree a thing and it shall be established. You shall decree a thing. Why we always got to make these confessions. We believe. What are you doing? You're making a declaration. Some of us even need to write it down so we can remember the date that the decree of debt freedom was written. Who am I preaching to? I declare debt freedom in your life. 
See, a king will decree a thing and it shall be established. How does a king reign? They rule by, come on, by decree. That's why we make bold declarations every week. That's why you should take this seriously. When in Matthew chapter 16, verse 19, Jesus said, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Listen, baby, it's not in the great by and by that you get the keys. You got the keys right now. And whatever you bind is bound. And whatever you lose, when you say money thou art loose, money is on its way. It's been tied up, held up, and held back by the forces of darkness in this world. But when you as a king stand to declare something loose, maybe your children aren't doing right. Maybe they aren't acting right. Maybe they're gone. They should be in charge, but no. They've been tied up by the devil doing all sorts of ungodly things. How does a king rule over his household? He rules by decree. Devil, you take your hand off my son. You take your hand off my daughter. You take your hand off my family. I declare it in the name of Jesus. You rule by decree. He said, thou shall decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. Take this seriously. Don't allow yourself to get flustered. Why we got to say all these confessions? Why every time I open up my bank account, I need to call it blessed? Because that's how a king reigns. Be blessed. Matthew 21, 21. <laughs> I believe this is a word for 21, 2021. Come on, somebody. He said, so Jesus answered and said unto them. These are his disciples. He said, assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but you also, if you say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. I need some of the sons and daughters, the kings that he is king of, to be able to stand up and speak to mountains in their life. If you're not talking to your mountain, you're not doing it right. Praise God. Whatever presents itself as a mountain, it means it's too big in the natural, too tall and beyond your ability. But Jesus said, I assuredly say to you, if you say it and not doubt it what you say will it will it will it will be done for you mm. I'm done now <laughs> I'm done now so now I leave you as you are about to be dismissed with Romans 5 and 17 if because of one man's trespass, lap, lapse, and offense, death reign through one, much more surely, those who receive God's overflowing grace, unmerited faith, and the free gift of righteousness, putting themselves in right standing with God, more surely they shall reign as kings in this life through one man, Jesus Christ. We're about done with this series, but I challenge you. Start reigning by decree. Decree a thing and watch it be established. And don't change it. Don't change it. You said it. You declared it. You'll pay for the house cash. You'll have it. It'll be exactly what you need. You'll pay for that car cash. It'll be exactly. You command cancer to leave. Glory to God. It'll leave. Glory to God. It doesn't matter. There's no mountain. Come on. I'm training you by the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of God is depositing this in you. Somebody say, I receive it. So now when you hear God say through Job 22, I'm done. But when you hear God say, you shall decree a thing. When you hear Jesus say, I give you keys. Until the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven has suffered by. But now that Jesus has come, the righteous, come on, the violent, take it by force. We got to take back what the devil stole. We got to take back what the devil, the devil stole the job. 
emptied out the account, all of this stuff, taking peace and taking healing. No. The righteous take it by force. Stand up with me.